Thank you so much, Jared and Heidi, Sabrina. Appreciate that. And uh, it is a good reminder. Um, as you mentioned, Sabrina, kind of a throwback, but still a great song. Thank you so much. Would you pray with me as we move into this part of our service? Lord, thank you once more that we can worship you and be here today and have the promise of your presence with us. Bless this time now as we delve more into your desires for us and learning more about the promises that you have for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am going to uh, continue in my uh, series that I'm doing here on faith matters, but I'm going to... Um, tied last week's message and this message together um, on character. And this is kind of a uh, this is kind of a, an intermission, you might say, in looking at different matters of faith or faith matters. But I thought it would be well to look at the structure of faith a little bit through the concept of uh, of character for um, a couple of the messages. And uh, I apologize if some of the colors and things got a little altered in. Um, in the PowerPoint, you never know when you move it from one computer to another exactly what it's going to look like. But we usually survive and do a good job. So this is this is character. This is Faith Matters Character 2.0, and um, this was uh, one of the uh, texts from um, Ellen White that I shared last week. That is, I think, um, indicative of the importance of character in the Christian life when she says that true sanctification is harmony with God, harmony with God. And then she gives a another phrase to indicate what that means. What does harmony with God mean? And she says this, oneness with Him in character. Character. Oneness with Him in character. Now that is a dynamic and, and uh, amazing statement that we could even aspire to have character that is in any ways um, like that of God. But that is what um, we are on the journey towards, is learning more about what it means to be one with God in character. So we're going to have a, a time of interaction with kids this morning, as I always like to have a kids quiz. Oh my goodness, this really went through some weird transitions. All right, but we can read it and we can make it work. All right, so this is all about Bible characters, and this is kind of like a uh, I'll give you some clues, and you tell me if you know who we're talking about, all right? And you raise your hand. The Bible says he was the humblest man on earth. It also tells us that he was afraid to obey God at first, but here's the one that I hope that you will notice. He was brave enough to ask to see God. Who asked to see God? He was very humble. Hey, Owen, is that you? All right. Thank you, Gina. Let's get it into the microphone. It's important. We're trying to, I'm trying to remember, I often forget. But for the recording and for those that are watching online, if it doesn't go through the microphone, go ahead and say it, Owen. Moses. You are right. We are talking about Moses. Moses is who this Bible character is. Number two, she was a brave little girl when she saved her younger brother. She was a prophetess and leader of Israel, but she suffered from jealousy. Who are we talking about here? She saved her little brother's life. Does that ring a bell? She was a prophetess and leader during the Exodus. <laughs> and she suffered from jealousy. Anyone know? Chloe's raising her hand. Last week she just shouted it out, but we want to get it through the mic, Chloe. Can you help us out here? Who is this? Maria. Didn't she get it right? Yes, excellent job, Miriam. Number three, he was a wise and devoted Bible student. He was faithful and honest, even when serving pagan or foreign leaders. He, uh, he had to, he was a slave. He was willing to openly pray to God, even when it was against the law. and There was a death penalty for praying to God. Oh, I see several hands. Go ahead. Daniel? Oh, is that Emmett? I didn't recognize you at first. You are right. It is Daniel. 
That's right. He was a good Bible student, knew his Bible, and uh, was faithful and honest. A lot of good characteristics about Daniel. Number four, she, now this is going to be a little tougher one, she was unfaithful and a sinner most of her life, but she gave her heart and hope to God by saving his spies, and she saved her whole family and even becomes part of the lineage of Christ. All right? Getting your steps in. Thank you for your help, Miss Gina. Rahab. Rahab. That is right. Rahab is who that is. And she is, even though she plays a very small role in the story, her act of faith is incredibly important throughout the Bible narrative and is a, a wonderful part of our Bible story. You know, these clickers are just sometimes a lot of fun. Number five, last one. She believed an angel even when what he promised was impossible. I haven't finished yet, Declan. No, it's okay. She was willing to accept God's plan even when it meant she might be rejected by her community and her family, but she became the most blessed of all women. Mary. Mary. Oh, I thought you were going to say your mom, but yes, Mary. Yes, Mary is who we're talking about here. We often can identify Bible characters by just a little bit about their story and their characteristics. These were some of the definitions of character that I indicated last week, just to dovetail in. Character is the moral and mental qualities that define us. Character is the attributes or features that distinguish our individuality or our essential nature, basic way of life, or fundamental personality. And I asked the question last week, and I didn't tease it out very much, does character matter to our faith? Or is it simply a bonus if we have character? As long as we have faith, that's enough. And then character, you know, that can be a secondary bonus. And I, I use the analogy of how much of a car can you own and still say that you own the car, right? You know, do you have to have it? Does it have to have the engine? Does it have to have the doors? How much of it do you have to have and still say, I have a car? And of course, there's some subjectivity to that. But I, again, I went back, I went to a, a little, just one verse in the little book of Philemon that I thought was so uh, 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 poignant to this idea of what it means to need to have character and faith. When Paul says in the book of Philemon, it's verse 6, and I think the entire epistle of, of Philemon might be in our Bibles because of this verse alone, when Paul says, I pray, I had it memorized, and then you get up here and you forget. I pray, I pray that the fellowship of your faith, okay, I remember it now. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of the good things of Jesus, uh, uh, of the good things of Jesus Christ for Christ's sake. But he says this, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. And which, again, it just draws out so many questions like, can you have ineffective faith? You say, well, I may, my faith may be ineffective, but it's still faith. Does it still, is it still faith if it's ineffective? It's like saying, I, I have a, a Ford Mustang, but it's just a model. Does it really count? What if it's a poster? Can you still say, I, I have a Ford Mustang if it's a poster? How much of it do you need to have to say that you really have it? And that, that was kind of the idea. Uh, does character matter to our faith? Um, I want to take you now to, to Second Peter. This is called Peter's Ladder. And again, I apologize. Oh, it looks better up there than it does on the screen. You can actually read it. Good. Um, uh, Peter's Ladder. In, in the first chapter of Second Peter, Peter goes through this list of characteristics. And it's called Peter's Ladder where he says, Now, with all diligence... I want you to add to your faith virtue or moral excellence. And to your moral excellence, add knowledge. And to your knowledge, self-control. And to your self-control, perseverance. And perseverance, um, godliness. And it, he gives all these qualities. It's called Peter's ladder. It's the idea that Peter is saying, your life as a Christian should grow. It should start with faith, and it should ultimately go, what's the top one there? Love. That's the goal. God is love, right? And we want to have, remember, uh, uh, true harmony or true sanctification is harmony with God or oneness with Him in character. What is God's character? Love, right? That's what we want to grow to. We want to become a person who is defined by love. 
And Peter gives us this stair step or ladder to, as an indicator of the journey we go on, beginning with faith and growing to love. And he goes, you need to add to it uh, moral excellence or virtue or integrity, depending on your Bible translation for the second one, and knowledge and, and all these things, growing to the point that we have uh, a likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is defined by love, right? And by the way, what is the transcript of God's character? It's the law, right? And Paul says that the law is fulfilled also by love. And the two great commandments are to love the Lord and love your neighbor. So all these things go together, having the character of God growing into his likeness, having the transcript of his character written on our hearts, and us having the characteristic of God being loved. We want to grow there. But as you look at this ladder, as you look at this sequence of characteristics that we want to go into, the thing that stands out to me is that in my experience, both personally and in ministry, I find that there's a temptation to sometimes stop this ladder about here. A lot of Christians kind of stop their growth right about here. And they say, well, I know faith is faith, believing in God, trusting God. Of course, that's the beginning. No journey. That's the first step. You got to have faith. Got to trust the Lord, have some kind of root system that goes into a knowledge and an acknowledgement of who God is. And then to that, the idea of virtue. And that's just, again, integrity, knowing right from wrong, moral excellence, making right choices. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. That's what Christians do. Now that I have faith in Christ, I'm going to put aside the sin that, uh, uh, you know, ensnares me and I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to understand what God's expectation. That's, that's virtue. And of course, knowledge. You know, of course, that's knowing, you know, uh, the things of the Bible and the truths of the Bible and uh, knowing prophecy and things like that. But for a lot of Christians, that's about where our our uh, perseverance is limited. And a little line is drawn there and we give lip service to the others. You say, oh, of course we want to have self-control. But, you know, when someone really cuts me off in traffic, they need to know they did wrong. I need to let them know how wrong they were. And there's some gestures that will help them understand that. And that's only good, you know. And steadfastness, that's perseverance, you know, endurance. You know, yeah, that's a good quality. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, things do get rough sometimes. And and sometimes the anger comes out, right? Godliness, oh, my goodness. I mean, who could ever be like God? That's a high quality. Yeah, I understand it. But, you know, nobody's perfect. But I want you to notice the seventh quality here, the one right before love. I mean, almost to the top of the ladder, just about there. I mean, you've grown and you're developing and you've got there. The very last one here in this, and I just borrowed this graphic off the Internet. I didn't make this up. My Bible calls it um, brotherly kindness. Here's brotherly affection. Really, it just means being nice. At the very top of this ladder is niceness. And it's amazing how quickly we, or how easily we as believers say, I don't need to be nice. I've got the truth. What does niceness have to do anything if you just have the truth? I had a youth pastor um, growing up. Um, His name was Darth Creek. And great guy, wonderful guy. Um, He grew up, his father ran a Christian bookstore, just like an ABC. And so he grew up, you know, with his brothers, and and he had one sister. What was the sister's name? I've forgotten that. It, yeah, it was Darren and Destry, Darth, and another D. I've forgotten. Anyways, but he and his siblings, what? Danae? Oh, okay. Um. Glad we cleared that up. Anyways, um, they growing up, you know, as, as you know, uh, an adolescent, they would stock the shelves and they would dust and they would work. And eventually when they got old enough, they would work the check stand and they, and, and uh, Darth, he always used to say, he said, I grew up in a Christian bookstore and I'm telling you, and it's funny that he got called into ministry and became a pastor. And Darth, if you ever watch this video, I, I hope that I'm representing you appropriately here. But this is as memory serves. Darth would say, and I will never, I will never work in a Christian bookstore again. And you'd say, why, Darth? What, why do you say that? He said, because Christians come in with a chip on their shoulder and they were so mean to me as a child. It almost destroyed my faith. They would come in and they would say, um, well, I paid my tithe. I should get 10% off. 
Why aren't you giving me 10% off? Uh, this other store sells these cards for 75 cents. Why are you charging a dollar? Mitch, you're laughing because you work in a bookstore. <laughs> you don't know anything about this, do you? But to him, again, this is just a story that I remember. To him, it kind of, it, it, it gave this idea that Christians often, not every, we don't want to paint with totally broad strokes here, but there's a tendency for us to think to ourselves, because of my faith, because of my appreciation for what Jesus has done, I really don't need to be nice or kind or considerate. I know what the truth is, and I, everyone should just recognize that. And if you were to ask yourselves, are Christians, and, and try to be fair here, try to be fair, do you believe the perceptions of Christians generally in the world is that they are nice people? Now, whether the reality is different than the perception, an argument can be made for that. But are Christians generally considered nice? Ask a Muslim. Now, here, let, let me, oh, yeah. So we often cut the line off here, and we give lip service to the others, and we say, that's enough. I have knowledge, I have faith, I have virtue. That's enough. I am now a loving person. I have now gone as high as I can go, and that is sufficient. And I think that this is a trap. I think this is a part of character development that we fall victim to, and we allow our own flesh and our own weaknesses to taint the rest of the journey on this ladder towards growing into the character of Christ. Um, but if you were to ask the question, are gener Christians generally regarded as nice? I think the answer is often no. No. They're not generally considered nice people. And yet, if you were to ask the question, is Christ generally regarded as nice? From a historical, geopolitical perspective, the answer would be yes. And again, I use the illustration of Muslims. Most Muslims respect at least the character of Jesus. Now, they don't believe in him the way we do. But they respect him as an authentic expression of Allah, of, of what a good and decent and nice prophet would look like. But they do not like Christians generally, and there's reasons historical and, 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 and all that. Oh, by the way, I can't help but say it here. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it now if that's okay. Billy Graham made one of the greatest mistakes of Christianity when he decided to call his efforts for evangelism, crusades. When he decided to call them crusades, it immediately set up a barrier between his presentation of the gospel to all people and Muslims. How many Muslims would want to go to a crusade to hear about Jesus? Well, let me ask you this. Would you go to a jihad to hear about Allah? And I'm not putting down Billy Graham. He did a lot of great things. He, he really loved presenting Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm not, but again, it just, it, it, it's just one of those historical misses. If he decided, and I, I encourage Christians today still sometimes want to call their efforts, their evangelistic series crusades. And I, and I want to say, even when I was in Michigan, uh, some churches were having crusades and Michigan has the highest Muslim population in, in, um, in America. And I just was like, don't, don't call it a crusade, guys. Do you understand what that means within the Muslim community? But Muslims generally, and Buddhists, and Hindus, um, Taoists, even atheists will generally look at Christ and say, he was a pretty nice guy. Pretty nice guy. But Christians, no. Now that's a problem. So here's the question. Are you? Are you generally regarded as nice? Now you can't always control what other, I'm a nice guy. People hate me, but I'm a nice guy. Now, there's a degree to where people are going to make their decisions, you know, what, no matter what you do. But where on that ladder do you put brotherly kindness, affection, and niceness? It is right next to that top pinnacle of being like the character of God, of being love, brotherly affection, kindness, niceness. And for many Christians, we say, nah, I don't need that. And I think that's a problem. It's not only by preaching the truth, not only by distributing literature that we are to witness for God. 
Let us remember that a Christ-like life, notice this, a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in the favor of Christianity. You agree with that? And there's nothing profoundly unique about that. It's, you know, if you don't walk the way you talk, people aren't going to respect you. A Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in the favor of Christianity. Living like the character of Jesus Christ. She goes on to say, a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldling. Not all the books written can serve the purpose of a holy life. Men will believe not what the minister preaches, but what the church lives. Notice that a cheap Christian character is worse than someone who rejects Christ completely. I want you to see if you can help me out here. What 20th century leader said this? The national government will preserve and defend the basic principles on which the nation has been built up. It regards Christianity as the foundation of our national morality and the family as the basis, basis of national life. He also said, my feelings as a Christian points, to me, points me to my Lord and Savior as a fighter. They're kind of Ronald Reagan-ish. Or maybe Margaret Thatcher although I said he already, so it's not Margaret. Nelson Mandela, and you can't see it because the slide changed, Adolf Hitler. 1933, Adolf Hitler said the first one, and in his book Mein Kampf, he said the second one. Cheap Christian character does more damage to the world than that of a worldly. Christianity devoid of Christ's character is the most potent toxin that we can create in this world. Even if Hitler could say these things, his life and everything that he did denied and betrayed it. We have to not cut short our journey of accepting the character of Christ. I was a teenager when the dollar store phenomenon kind of exploded. You guys remember when you first started seeing these coming around? In the late 90s, this became the fastest growing business in America, the dollar store concept. There were more dollar stores opening than there were Starbucks for a while. I mean, it just kind of was amazing. In my little town um, uh, of Yakima, Washington, where I grew up, I remember seeing the first dollar store. And they, they had different names. There was Dollar General and the 99 cent store. And now Dollar Tree is kind of, they've, they've kind of cornered the market on the dollar store concept. But I remember going for uh, the first time to a dollar store. And I, I'm a teenager. I don't have a lot of money. What little money I have is, you know, pretty precious to me because it only goes so far. And I remember going to the dollar store and just being like, everything's a dollar. That's incredible. I'm going to get some chips over here, get some crackers and uh, get some, you know, silly string. You know, I was just loading up my basket with dollar store items because it was all a dollar. And I went up to the register and I dump out my little basket. Yeah, we got 20 little things here to give me about 20 bucks and a dollar each. What a deal. You guys aren't excited like I am. I don't know. I guess I only get excited. Okay, I got a witness over here. All right. And uh, the checker, she's going through, ringing up everything, and I'm just jiving with the whole thing. And all of a sudden, I see some things go through the scanner, $2. Wait, what? No, dollar store. Another one goes through, $4. <laughs> Penalty on the play. What's going on? One thing ring up $5 devastating to me. And I, I, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the dollar store. What happened? Did you ring it through too many times? And the checker, obviously she'd had a lot of people go through and explain to her, you know, kind of complain. She said, oh, sorry, sir. That's just the name of the store. Not everything in here is a dollar. Have you ever fall into that trap? Did you know that the 99 cent store does not mean everything's 99 cents? It means that everything ends in 99 cents. That's false advertisement, if you ask me. That's travesty. But it, it, she just was, and she was very apologetic. But she just said, I'm sorry. That's just the name. But it's not the reality when you come into the store. Friends, if we lack the growth into the character of Christ that we're called to, 
then we are the same thing. No matter what the name on the door says, we are not representing what we claim to be. We may say that we represent Christ and say we're a Christian church, but if we lack His character, we are just as hollow and just as as irritating (laughs) as a store that claims to be one thing but actually is something else. We claim to keep the Sabbath, but we don't have the character of the Lord of the Sabbath. What good is it? We claim to preach creation, but have failed to appreciate the Creator. What have we really gained? We have to be authentic in our calling of who we are to be like Christ. A couple of verses here just to, or passages rather, this is from Spirit of Prophecy. In the viewing the holiness and glory of God of the universe, we are terrified, for we know that His justice will not permit Him to clear the guilty. But we need not remain in terror, for Christ came to the world to reveal what? He came to reveal the character of God. Why? So that we could just stand back and say, that's great. Man, is that nice. To make plain to us his paternal love toward his adopted children. It was so that we could embrace and pursue the character that he calls for us. She goes on to say, eventually, we are not to estimate the character of God by the stupendous works of nature alone, but by the simple lovely life of Jesus who presented Jehovah as more merciful, more compassionate, more tender than even our earthly parents. You know that she also says that Satan's primary work is to distort the character of God. To deceive us. That's what he did in the Garden of Eden. You think you know God? Well, let me tell you different. God said this. Well, he didn't really mean that. He meant something else. The whole work of Satan from the time the war broke out in heaven until it spilled out onto planet Earth was to distort and to destroy the realization of the who the character of God is. And he continues to do that in our life as well. As the heart is converted to the truth, the work of transformation goes on. From day to day, the Christian has an increased measure of understanding. The mind devoted unreservedly to God under the guidance of the divine spirit develops generally and harmoniously. The weak, vacillating character becomes changed through the power of God to one of strength and steadfastness. steadfastness rather. Continual devotion and piety uh, establish so close a relation between Jesus and his disciple that the Christian becomes like him in mind and Character. Mind and character. Here it is in the end of Peter's ladder here. He says, and in your godliness, add to it brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I underline useless because I mentioned last week Philemon when he was appealing, when Paul's appealing to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, Onesimus' name means useful. That's what useful means, and he uses that uh, language. He says, he who was to you once useless has now become very useful. Increasingly they, re- increasingly, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. That's sad, isn't it? Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. That's a pretty beautiful promise. You will never stumble. For in this way you will enter to the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as He abundantly supplies your need. That's how the passage ends. Friends, the character of God growing into the likeness of Christ is not secondary to the journey of faith. It is a primary goal of every Christian to take seriously every step in that ladder and not draw the line and cut it short and say, I will only grow this far no further. When I was in college, um, interacting with a lot of the, my um, 
friends that I was making on campus. Of course, everyone, one, one of the first questions everyone asks is, what are, you, what are you studying? What's your major? What are you pursuing here in college? And um, of course, I would say, well, I'm studying theology and I'm pursuing becoming a pastor. And I can't tell you how many times, this is, this is Walla Walla. This is not you know, some uh, public school or non-Christian school. This was at Walla Walla. I cannot tell you how many times my fellow classmates, when I would say I'm, I'm studying to become a pastor, good people, believers, they would say, wow, oh, that's great, but I could never do that. I just can't be that nice. I can't be that nice. I know what they meant, but even back then I remember feeling kind of bad. I remember thinking, so you need your space to be mean. You know, and you do live a fishbowl experience. I understand. You, 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 you put yourself out when you're in ministry, when you're in leadership. And, and th there are, you know, uh, a different set of, uh, you know, expectations and rules. And I get what they were saying. But that statement, I could never be that nice or I can't be that nice all the time, they would say. I remember feeling sad saying, but, you know, what I'm trying to do is help people realize that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can and you should. You should want to. So are you a nice Christian? Is brotherly affection flowing through your Christian experience? And are people drawn to Christ because they see Him in you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank You so much that we can examine analyze these things together. Father, none of us have arrived. We're all at different levels of stages on this growth and this ladder that Peter lays out for us. And we all have much to learn and, and we need patience and help and forgiveness and mercy every single day. But Father, I pray that we would make it our purpose to not cut ourselves short. Or really, Lord, it's cutting you short when we predetermine that we will not uh, continue to pursue a life of godliness and growing into your character. It is a high calling, but it is the expectation that that is what we all are pursuing and doing together. And none of the other elements of faith are really going to be of much benefit to us or to others if we are not first and foremost established in our relationship with you and growing into your likeness, Father. We want to have your spirit with us. We know it can only happen through the power of that you provide through your word and through your spirit. So God, just bless us. Help us to not fall short. You promise us that if we do this, if we pursue these qualities, that we will never stumble. And coming from someone like Peter, to say that, Peter, who often stumbled, who had many areas in his life that are revealed in Scripture where he failed and fell short, he could say that to us, just inspires us with so much confidence that you will always be with us. So Lord, help us. Help us to grow into your character, to have your qualities. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being here. God bless you. Please don't forget that tonight the gym will be open at 6.30 if you want to take advantage of that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sabbath. God bless.